Maddie uh, George. Are we on? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, as long as this... Is there a light? I thought I turned the lights on. No, it's fine. Yes, it, it, it is recording, okay. um, but no rush. So, um, Arm, why don't you uh, identify yourself for the record, so to speak? Hi. <laughs> I'm Arm. <laughs> and I'm doing this because my cousin liked me to do it, and his son mm -hmm. is doing it. And we're going to have some fun. We're yeah. going to talk about ourselves. So I grew up in Borough Park, and a uh, big Dodge fan. In, in the 40s, 50s? In the 40s. Uh, yeah, I, I, sorry. I was born in 43. Okay. Okay. And uh, the Dodge left in 57. I, I can't remember never being a Dodge fan. And we went to many games, as many as we, sometimes on a trolley, we got a little older. Um, and uh, what I was saying is when we got to the ballpark, when we went inside the ballpark, you, you get different smells when you walk inside the ballpark. But the best smell was going out onto the part of the field where you could see uh, the grass growing and then for me, the smell of the grass was uh, was a big deal. Well, um, you, 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 that's because we lived in Brooklyn. Right. And, uh, there's only one tree in the whole borough, apparently. A tree. <laughs> uh, but a tree does grow in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I was just trying to look, just trying to find it. <laughs> but, you know, in just thinking about it, well, I was, this is Alan, and I was born in 1944, and, uh, Armin and his brother Richie and I spent a ton of time together every weekend. Every we, summer. I would either, and every summer, but on the, in Brooklyn, I would take the bus, so my mom or dad would drive us to his house on 42nd Street in Borough Park, or they would come take the bus to Shore Road, sure. and we'd play in some of the parks below, mm -hmm. below our house. Uh, but uh, just generally, uh, we became and were, and, and I think Armin still is, a Dodger Dodger fans, um, and we hated <laughs> we hated the Yankees and the Giants. Actually, the Giants more than the Yankees, I think. But we hated them both. The Giants were the traditional rival. Back in those days, we uh, the Dodgers played them 22 games a year, either in Manhattan or in Brooklyn. That's a lot of games. And the teams hated each other. There were always fights that would break out in the games. And the Yankees, they were just so good. That's why we hated them. They kept winning championship after championship. They beat our Dodgers in 47, 49, 52, and 53. Um, so we wound up hating the Yankees as, as well. Uh, but we, as Armin said, we went to a number of games, uh, some of them together, some some uh, separately, that we'd, we'd be happy to share our, our memories with you. You mentioned the fights. Were those uh, team versus team? Were those were those in the stands or, or both? Uh, well, I think for the most part, the it was the players. <laughs> there was this pitcher, Sal Magley, Sal Magley, who would throw at your head. They called him the barber because his pitches hmm. came right close to your face. Hmm. And he and Carl Farillo, our right fielder, didn't see, both Italians, didn't see eye to eye. And there were games where he would throw at Farillo, and Farillo would take his bat and head for the mound, and there'd be a brawl. Actually, I saw him throw. I saw him throw the bat at Magley. He almost killed the shortstop, though. <laughs> yeah. And uh, on a two strikes, he had two strikes on him. He just took the bat and went like that. Ironically, ironically, in 1956, the Dodgers traded Jackie Robinson for Sal Magley. <laughs> Robinson retired, but Magley came to the Dodgers. He was kind of a washed-up pitcher. He went 14 and six, pitched a no-hitter, won a World Series game in 1956. Pitched no hitter, and we loved him. Yeah, he the same year Erskine that year? did. Same year Erskine did. And all of a sudden, from hatred, I don't remember it, that. it became love. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> I did anyway. Uh, but we should up. talk about the uh, the Carl Erskine's no hitter. What, what do you remember about that? Uh, not as much as you do, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> I know that we got into the ballpark on uh, 
what I recall as Borden's popsicle sticks. I thought it was, well, it was Borden something. It was Borden something. What, before we get there, what, what year was this? 56. Okay. Yes, I, look, I looked it up. I sent you guys an article. Mm -hmm. And so I also saw uh, Koufax pitch in Brooklyn, and he was wild. I mean, well, I, mean, I think I, the up. game that I saw him pitch was like late in the season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just come up, I think. And uh, he walked 10 and struck out 12, something like that. <laughs> Probably in two innings. Yeah. But we were sitting uh, in the, my memory, the left center field bleachers, because those were the seats that you could get with these... Uh, Popsicle sticks or whatever it was. I think I remember you had also mentioned something about milk caps. I thought it was milk carton. It could cups, be. It could be. But it's one or the other. I don't yeah. have that terrific of memory, but yeah. I remember getting in for popsicle sticks. But that may not have been for that game. Yeah. Um, and you said fifty-six, right? So you guys are twelve, thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. Mm -hmm. And Richie, I'm sure, was with us. You'd have to ask. Like, me. I don't yeah. remember. Just don't remember. Because the three of us would do a lot of stuff together. So I was trying to figure out how we got to the games. I guess yeah. uh, yeah, I... What I said to Adam uh, is that either one of our parents dropped us off or we took some public transportation. Um, thinking um, trolley from Borough Park. Was, it, was there a trolley? I don't yeah, know. There was. we ran on 39th Street. Actually, he went all the way to Bedford Avenue. That's where the last stop was, yeah. and uh, that's where the that's where the park was on Bedford Avenue. Yeah. And you know, living that close to 39th Street, I don't know if we ever did that or not. I know it was, it was a possibility. So Erskine was my favorite pitcher on the Dodgers. Uh, he was a fairly slight, probably about five ten. You know, pitchers today are 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, and some of them were then too, like Don Newcomb, for example. And he was a down-to-earth uh, country boy from Anderson, Indiana. And I always liked him. And um, he had pitched a no-hitter before in 1952 or three against the Cubs. And this was a game against the New York Giants, our bitter enemy. And... Um, he, he no hit them. I have one other uh, memory of, of a game that I went to uh, with Erskine, and it's one of my favorite memories. It was the 1952 World Series, Dodgers Yankees, of course. And Erskine uh, gave up four or five runs in early, and the manager, and I, I didn't hear this, but the manager came out to the mound took the ball out of his hand. I read about this. And he says, hey, Oisk. That's how the Brooklynites talk. This was Charlie Dressen, his name was. He was kind of a crude guy like Leo DeRocha. Hey, Oisk, isn't this your fifth anniversary? And Erskine said, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Dressen. And he says, well, don't you want to have a good time with your wife tonight, take her out to dinner? He said, uh, I certainly do, Mr. Dressen. And meanwhile, Erskine thinks he's gone because he took the ball out of his hands. And he's, so he hands him the ball back and he says, well, get out there and finish this effing game. Hmm. So Erskine settled down, the Dodgers chipped away, and the game went into, got tied in the ninth. Duke Snyder had a double to tie the game. 11th inning, they went ahead by one. And the Yankees had three batters coming up. It was like Hank Bauer, Johnny Mize, and Mickey Mantle, like three of the top power hitters in the game. And Erskine, uh, he got them out. One of them was a strikeout. One was a long fly ball to left field that the left fielder caught. I forget the third. But this was considered to be the best World Series game until... Carlton Fisk in 1975 oh. when he hit a home run in the 11th inning uh, to beat the Cincinnati Reds for the Red Sox. So well, that, that was I can think of cool. another game. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no. <laughs> Save that for the end. <laughs> go ahead. Fact, I, you know, I, I was thinking about, like, I have to stop from the game. It's, it's, just, it's in the house, by the way. <laughs> you know why I have to stop? 
I you must have thrown yours out, right? The uh, I think I still have it, but somewhere. I had written down I had terrible memory where I parked the car. So I wrote <laughs> I wrote down row L, seat number one on the stub, because I needed that to get back to the car. <laughs> so it's in the house. So what he's <laughs> talking about is the nineteen eighty six World Series. And the Red Sox, I had been to game five at Fenway Park. Bruce Hertz shut them out, shut the Mets out 3 nothing. So the Red Sox are up 3-2. to two. All they need is one win back at Shea Stadium. And uh, I, uh, I wanted to go to this game. The first game was a Wednesday. This was like a Saturday. Or it was Saturday night. Yeah. Saturday night. So yeah. it was a, there was a gap. Friday they had off. Mm -hmm. So I called this friend of mine who was a client, his name was John McEnough. And I said, hey, John, can you get me uh, tickets to the World Series on Saturday? He says, uh, call me back in a half hour. So I called him back in a half hour. He says, well, I got you two seats, but you'll have to come pick them up tonight at my office. Uh, they'll get you in the house, they're not that great. I said, oh, wonderful, wonderful. So I called Neil. I think. who was almost in the same building where hmm. McEniff was in New York. Neil picked them up. Then I called Armin. I said, hey, Armin, I got, I got a, a nice deal for you. All you've got to do is to drive to Manhattan tomorrow morning, pick up two tickets from my brother-in-law, Neil, then drive to the airport, pick me up, <laughs> and you can go to the World Series. So he says, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he did. <laughs> and that's how we went. And the thing about that game was it was odd because before the game started, like it was the first inning, a, a guy parachuted onto the field. He almost, right he almost took out the Mets pitcher. Ojeda was the pitcher. Was it? Bobby yeah. Ojeda? And it was just, people were amazed. So everyone cheered, but they, of course, they got him off the field, you know, and arrested him. And, Oh, it wasn't planned. No. Uh -huh. Some guy just was like a stunt. I don't know where he came, but he came right over my shoulder. We were sitting, right? We were sitting at the picture, Chase Stadium, mm -hmm. as far up as you want to be, on the left hand side of like first on place. left field, yeah, right on the break hmm. where it opens up. Okay, that guy came right up. He came right from I, above. No, my I, head. Haven't, I haven't looked to my left. I don't know why. And he was just. <laughs> And, and then, of course, the Red Sox are ahead 4-2 uh, going into the, well, was, uh, was it the 11th inning? It was 2-2, uh -huh. and the Red Sox scored two, and the scoreboard said, congratulations, this is at the Mets Stadium, congratulations, Red Sox. Right? But the game's not over. Not over. Oh, man. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it started to fall apart. And, uh, and it was, at, in the, uh, Bottom of that inning, uh, there was only one person in the stadium cheering. <laughs> and I was sitting next to him. <laughs> it, was, it was unreal. It was unreal. It was just like otherworldly. Everything went wrong all at once. And I'm going to quote myself, okay? Uh, the best went out. The first two guys went out, okay? Next, next two, two guys, three guys hit singles. And the manager comes out. What's the manager comes out? They take out the pitcher, right. and I swear to God, I, I'm sitting right next to your dad. I said, you know, wouldn't it be funny if this game turned on a wild pitcher or an error? If I had said a wild pitch and an error, you would have killed me, and you would have gotten off. <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 the play pitch. that everyone wild pitch and then, uh, and then, uh, remembers is that it went through. Bill Burtner? Yeah. 
Went yeah. through the first baseman's legs. Right. Mookie, what's his name? Wilson. Don't, Mookie Wolf. Don't forget that, I am. Wilson. Wilson. Kill you. And uh, anyhow, it was just stunning. I, I, I couldn't even talk. I was so upset. He was, he Alan, me Alan was just standing like a statue. He me to Brooklyn, I think. I probably standing like a over. statue, looking at it at first base and um, with total disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> How could it be? Game is freaking over. <laughs> oh, jeez. Anyway, so. I mean, I remember one story you told me. Uh, I think it was at the with the Dodgers, but you said somebody who was a power hitter. And I don't know who it was, but you just, I remember you saying, as the ball was leaving the stadium, it was still going up. Oh, Klazuski. Um, but I don't... Ted Klazuski. Yeah. Ted Klazuski. I think it's still going up. <laughs> he was with Cincinnati. I think the funniest thing I've ever seen, as far as a home run was concerned, uh, the Dodgers had a kind of a washed up pitcher named Preacher Rowe. <laughs> and um, Preacher Rowe had no fastball. I mean, at this point of his career, he could throw the ball hard. And uh, Dodgers were playing the Boston Braves, which is a long time ago. Long time ago. 1950, maybe. And this guy, Joe Adcock, was at the plate. And Rowe threw one of his pitches, okay? Looper? Yeah. And Adcock went like that, and the ball hadn't reached home plate. And he brought the bat back and hit the ball into the upper deck in left field. The truth, I mean, I, I'm, I was at that game, and it's, it's the guy goes, boom, and then he brings the bat back, and that's how slow that pitch was. I was going to say, he had time to do that. He couldn't, yeah, yeah he had nothing left. But you know, the uh, the Dodgers, uh, their nickname was the Bums, actually. Okay. And the Brooklyn Bums. And uh, this is a uh, memorial 40th anniversary collector's edition of the year that the Dodgers finally won the World Series in 1955. I'm going to give it to Armin. As a present. Yeah, I'm gonna give Adam a present too. <laughs> but you can see one of the famous um, if you want it. cartoons yeah, of, of the Brooklyn Dodgers is that image of the bump. Oh right in the corner? Yeah. You so, can take that home. It's, uh, you'll see stuff you haven't seen before. I think and it's yeah, who's I just the wanna, bum one now. sec, I just wanna get that? this into the camera. Oh um, and show the, yeah. the back shows Evans Field so you can turn it around. Yeah, so that's what it is. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, so that's our, basically all the bullfucks. Oh, is that right? Huh. Yeah. So nineteen fifty five. Yeah. 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 Was cool. the year they actually won it all. The Dodgers had never won a World Series and they beat Thank you. They, Welcome. They beat the Yankees. Uh, so it was a really big year for for Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> This is next year. In other words, I used to say, wait till next year at the end of every year, because they mm -hmm. came close but never won it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was next year. Mm -hmm. But there's one other game that um, I was at. I don't think Armin was at this no, game. we talked about that. Right? We were talking about this game. So, and I looked this one up. It was also, uh, uh, well, it was 1953, mm -hmm. and Robin Roberts was a stud pitcher for the Philadelphia Phillies, and he completed almost every game he started. And some days he was great, some days he was good, some days he was not so good. Like he would win 24 games and lose 18 something. Some Five years in a row, I think. I yeah, uh, over 20. 20. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this particular game, I was at this game, and it was 6-5 Phillies going into the bottom of the ninth inning. And uh, basically, one, two, three, four Hall of Famers were about to bat. Pee Wee Reese, who was a Hall of Famer, walked. Duke Snyder, who was my hero growing up, hit into a double play. He was a left-handed power hitter. Jackie Robinson walked. And Roy Campanella, with two out. So bases are loaded. No, no. 
Walk, uh, double play. Double play. Oh, okay. Two out. Walk. So. And then Roy Campanella mm. hit the ball in the first mm. row of the center field bleachers mm. for a home run, and they won 7-6. to six. Mm. It was wow. in May of 1953, actually. You know, I went to a game where the Dodgers were uh, down in the ninth inning, and uh, uh, Jackie Robinson came up. And he hit a line drive, but it hit uh, the, I put it, the, uh, the stands in left field had like a, like a, a pole that went above the stands. Mm -hmm. Hit the pole. Like a railing kind came of Came back to the left field. Uh, left field threw the ball into uh, home plate. I'm sorry, not into home plate, into second base. And Robinson actually wound up with a single. And I'm disgusted, right? The next guy up is Campanella. He hit the ball about four, about 400 feet. It was one the game. So it was the same. Was that the ninth same inning, too? Ninth inning. Yeah. yeah. He was a good clutch hitter. I mean, I thought the game was tied when Robinson hit the uh, hit the wall because he went over the left fielder's head and, it, right. and hit off the, not even off the wall, but off that railing. So, so um, where is that picture? So this is the moment when they won the World Series here. And number 39 is Roy Campanella, the catcher. And the pitcher was a man by the name of Johnny, uh, Johnny Padres. Um, and he won two games in that, that World Series. Probably the best game he ever pitched. Yeah. yeah. But, um, and then they started getting old in 1956. They won the pennant. Got to the World Series and the Yankees beat them. <laughs> Usually these series were four games to three as well. But the Yankees would almost always win, except for 55. Just, uh, it, it was exciting to watch. They really mm -hmm. were. I mean, they had great players. I mean, think about it, a lot of those guys. Yeah, a lot of Hall of Famers. And one that didn't, should have, which is Gil Hodges. The first baseman. Mm -hmm. But he'd go around the infield, he, Hodges was Hall of Fame caliber, and Jackie Robinson, obviously, and Pee Wee Reese, mm -hmm. and Campanella. And Snyder. Well, I mean, as far as the infield was oh, concerned. Oh, the infield, yeah. Uh, yeah. Campanella. And then, mm -hmm. Frill had a good career, too. For, yeah, the right fielder. And they had a, uh, a third baseman. Was a very good defensive third baseman. He probably won some gold gloves, but who knows? Billy Cox. Billy Cox. Yeah. Right. He was like probably a two sixty hitter, but he was a very good fielder. You said that Darius Stone is your favorite Dodger. Favorite Darius pitcher. A uh, pitcher. And uh, 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 of course, Snyder. So he's said from Indiana, right? He's from Indiana. Guess what? What? My favorite player was Gil Hodges he from, from Indiana. Indiana. Yeah. yeah. Who's your Hoosier. But he lived on Bedford Avenue. Oh, he goodness. settled. He settled in Brooklyn. He never went back, as far as I know. And, uh, I guess that's another interesting thing. Like in those days, of course, you're kind of a quasi celebrity or celebrity because you're a baseball star. But I don't think you made a lot of money. No. Though, right. No. You know, back then. Yeah, you're right. This I mean, nowadays it's millions. You're right. making millions, but I think it was not that way. Right? No, they most of them had summer jobs. Uh, not summer jobs, winter jobs. Hmm. Ferrello yeah. owned a grocery store. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know they they might make twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a year, which wasn't bad money back then. Right. But uh, it certainly wasn't anything like what they what they make today. Mm -hmm. Free agency has mm -hmm. turned the game around uh, because they couldn't negotiate uh, really because if the club drafted the player, they had the rights uh, to his services forever. I mean, you could either sit out or try to get traded or play for what they offered. Mm -hmm. That changed. Yeah. It's a uh, union negotiator by the name of Marvin Miller, 
who uh, you know changed that. The, the players struck, et cetera, and they um, they got the free agency. They tried to bust it a couple of years before it with Kirk Flood, to, uh, yeah. with, to no avail, but um, sat out. He didn't want to. He didn't want to be a slave, so to speak. Mm -hmm. you know? Good times, though. I mean, it's some great players that really sacrifice themselves for that. Mm -hmm. Speaking, yeah. I guess, you know, when you say that, I think of Jackie Robinson. A lot of things that you've told me is that, like, when people would slide, it was second base, was he? Yeah. And so when people, when players would slide, they'd slide cleats up, cleats right. up you know. Spikes up, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they were vicious to him. Uh, but, you know, he was a feisty guy, and he could take it, and he was kind of, uh, what shall I say, he was a provocateur in his own way, uh, uh, especially as he grew older in, in, in the game. Uh, but he, he suffered a lot of, a lot of abuse. Um, uh, the, the article that I sent you about that no-hitter, um, the uh, New York newspaper, giant, you know, favorable to the Giants, commented about how Erskine was all washed up, had nothing left, mm -hmm. and that uh, the Dodgers, Robinson, and others were getting old, and they were over the hill. Mm -hmm. So after, <laughs> after the game and after the no-hitter, Robinson went to the Giants' dugout and screamed at them about, you know, that's how, you know, something along the lines, uh, yeah, he's really washed up, isn't he? You know, <laughs> something like that. He was always getting into issues with the other team. And at least at that point in his career, he had great confidence in himself and the rightness of what he was doing. And he wasn't afraid to get into a controversy or a fight with anyone. Well, you know most of the story, because they well documented it, as far as Robertson was concerned, with the movies and stuff like that, TV shows, and you probably have seen some of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a movie called uh, 42 about Jackie right. Robinson. There's another one called The Jackie Robinson Story, which he played himself. Huh. He's and not Ruby a great Dee actor. Ruby played his wife. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. He's, he's not a great actor. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can uh, you can't excuse play you him. Play. <laughs> it's a good point. If you can't play yourself. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, where is that? Uh, where's the carpool? This article is actually pretty sweet. Uh, Carl Erskine was saying that I mm -hmm. sent you guys. He, he was, that they used to carpool to the game, and that day, Duke Snyder and I and Pee Wee, Reese drove. We got out of the car. We saw a New York newspaper. The newspaper said the Dodgers were over the hill, and the headline especially pointed out that Jackie Robinson and Roy Campanella uh, were no longer what they once were, and specifically said, Erskine can't win with that garbage he's been throwing. <laughs> so at the end of the, after the no hitter, uh, Robinson, let's see, if, what did he actually say? Jackie went over to the Giants dugout, pulled out a clipping of the newspaper article, and yelled out, How's that garbage? <laughs> <laughs> Robinson did something that, again, I don't think I've ever seen another ball player do. If he hit a single to like uh, right center field, left center field, he would uh, overrun first base by 20 or 30 feet, daring him to throw back and try to get him. And as soon as the guy would throw the ball back to first base, he'd take off and go to second base. Mm -hmm. never, seen any, never seen anybody do that mm -hmm. except for him. Yeah, he had great... Very, very smart man. Yeah, great instincts. Uh, I don't know that he had the speed that some other players had. He just was very instinctual about when, you know, when to go and try to seal a base, etc. Mm -hmm. And the other thing he did was he would dance off third base. When he was on third base, he'd drive, especially right-handed pitchers, 
he'd drive him crazy because he'd be dancing back and forth. I never documented that. He actually scored a run on two consecutive balks. Really? On balks? Yeah, so, so they... I mean, dancing off, you know... But what, what often happened is they became so distracted that they couldn't find the plate, and they'd <laughs> walk the next batter, that type of thing. <laughs> and if Yogi was alive, he would tell you that he was at... He stole home in the World <laughs> Series, Jackie did. Yogi, I'm sure you could see Yogi jumping up and down. He jumped up <laughs> like and down. Like a madman. And to, the, to the day of his death, he said he was out. He <laughs> never forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen that play any number of times. There is no way anybody could tell me whether he's safe or not. No, it was a bang-bang play. I don't know. I don't think replay would have reversed it. It was that close. I don't know. They had it. Well, he wouldn't have been able to block the plate these days. Uh, not the way he did, without the ball. Yeah. I don't know, some of his rules that they have nowadays drive him crazy. Yeah, you can't block the plate as a catcher because too many people are getting hurt. Right. So you have to, you know, just reach and tag the guy. Hmm. But they, you, you used to stand right in front of the plate and the guy to get in had to bowl you over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one guy that should be in the Hall of Fame, uh, Pete Rose, in the in the uh, All Star game, yeah, barreled he, into he hurt the catcher. catcher. Catcher, I don't, I don't, I don't know if he caught another game or not. After yeah. that, he got hurt yeah. pretty bad. But he was a. That's how they used to play the game, rough and tumble. Okay, mm -hmm. and Rose just played that way. Mm -hmm. Charlie Hustle. So I have two other stories. One is that, well, three. When the, uh, in 1951, there was a three-game playoff, Dodgers-Giants, for the, the right to play the Yankees in the World Series. And the third game, uh, it went to the third game, and uh, the Dodgers were up 4-2. to two, And I'm walking home from school. And uh, the radios, you know, as you walk, Everyone had his radio on. But when I got to our building, this was in Bensonhurst, um, the superintendent who lived on the first floor had the window open. It was, it was October, early October. And uh, Funny, I remember his name. Yeah. Margo, no. Margo, Mr. Margo. Oh. And Johnny was Margo no. was his son. And uh, the game was in the ninth inning. Dodgers are winning 4-2. They took Don Newcomb out, put in uh, Ralph Branca, Two on, I don't know, one out, two out, probably two, two out. out. And yeah. Jack, uh, Bobby Thompson hit the ball in the first or second row of the very short bleachers in left field. It was like 279 feet away. Uh, and the Giants won the pennant. And I started crying. You weren't the only one. Yeah. <laughs> My story is I got actually the same story, except I was going home from school listening to the game. And uh, when I got to my house, I went up the two flights of steps, turned on the TV. Back then, you waited for the TV to go on. Because oh, it was too Yeah, it they took, had to warm to up. To go out to warm up. Mm -hmm. And the first image I saw was that ball going to the left, left oh, field. Geez. And I'm standing in front of the TV set and bawling. Uh, and my mother said to me, what happened? Did the Dodgers <laughs> <laughs> That's how serious we were oh, on God. the baseball team. Mm -hmm. How bad was that? <laughs> I remember too, Dad, you used to say, you know, like, you, everybody, like, all the radios in the different houses would be on whenever they played. So you could just walk down the sidewalk and listen to the game as you went from, like, house to house with the radios right. on. It's well, that, there weren't a lot of TVs around either. I mean, right. I, the fact that I had a TV in the house was a little unusual. Mm -hmm. and I, yeah. My dad loved, we didn't have a lot of money, but my dad loved electronic things, okay? Mm -hmm. He's always big on that. So mm -hmm. we had the TV. So my, but, other, my other story is the 1953 World Series. I, I was very privileged. My dad took me to a World Series game in 52. That's the game with, you know, with Carl Erskine, Erskine. 
By the way, his nickname was Oisk. O I S K. I think you mentioned that came up earlier. Yeah. yeah. How would you O I O O I S K? I looked huh. it up. That's Brooklyn for Erskine. Hmm. Brooklyn for Erskine. Oisk. Do you want a splash? Uh, yeah, I'll have a refreshment. So, this was uh, at Ebbets Field, and I went to the game, and I'm sitting. My memory is on the first base side, pretty good seats. And next to my dad was a guy who was about his age, and he would have been about almost 40. And uh, I was uh, nine, maybe, 1953. And the, uh, there was a guy sitting next to him who was a similar age, and next to him were a bunch of old men. And the guy leans over, because it was unusual for a kid to go to a World Series game at that time. Uh, he leans over and he says, how would you like to get some autographs, uh, autographs of some real old timers? And I said, sure. So I hand my program down. Now, I had been keeping score of the game, and I started getting stressed out because it was taking a long time for these guys to sign the program. <laughs> and I was losing track of what the next batter did and the next batter, and I wanted to make sure I got my scorecard right. So finally, it comes back, and I continue keeping score. Go back to our apartment on 88th Street and Shore Road, put it in a drawer uh, where the telephone was in the living room. 20 to 25 years later, I open that drawer up and I'm leafing through family pictures and I see this program. And someone had written uh, 1953 World Series, 50th anniversary of the first World Series, and there were a bunch of signatures. and. Uh, they were players who played in 1903 for either the Red oh, wow. Sox or the Pirates. And right in the middle is Cy Young. And I, I still have that. You didn't know that? No, I don't know that you had that signature. Yeah, I, I do. Right in the middle is Cy Young. There are about six signatures. Do you know who the others are? Yeah, I, we got their names. I don't know that... There was another guy by the name of Bill Deneen, who was a very good pitcher. I don't know if he was a Hall of Famer. He might be. But he won more games in that World Series than Cy Young. The Red Sox won the World Series. Um, and there were four others, but they were all recognizable uh, members of the Pirates or the uh, Red Sox. I have one uh, famous autograph, but it's not, not a baseball player. Jesse Owens. Really? Where'd you get that? Remember, uh... You don't tell Adam who he is first. At least that's the first black... You can look, you can look him up, okay? He was probably the... Um, Pretty. In the 1936... Right, right. 1936, he... Uh, kind of... Uh, Olympics, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah it's a big story. Uh, we went to, I don't know if you want, you had to be with me, um, a double header at Yankee Stadium. Was uh, it Yankee dad, Stadium or the Polo Grounds? No, Uncle? Yankee Stadium, because your dad had the seats over there. Oh. You, you don't remember? Well, who was, who was playing? Yankees were playing whatever, the <laughs> Los Angeles team, they had different, uh, not, uh, I forget what the name of the team was. One of the teams from the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Bottom of the tenth inning, the game is tied. Okay, they changed the pitcher. They brought a right-hand pitcher in to pitch to Mickey Mantle. And uh, that you want me to? Because that was his weaker side, mm -hmm. and the pitcher fell behind him two and zero. Oh. And threw a meatball. I mean, like I high, and Mantle hit right underneath the facade in right in right center field, and the ball when it hit the right underneath the facade, it was going up. That's that's what I was. That's what that's the story that I was talking about. Where yeah, it was, it it was just going. It up. just missed the up. Yeah, mm -hmm. didn't hit the facade. He, mm -hmm. Later on, he hit the facade, but on a ball that was coming down. This mm -hmm. one was upright. Mm. And the other home run that um, 
was an impression on me was uh, when the Mets were playing initially, when they started out, they played in the polo grounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had. Let me close They're playing against the Dodgers at the time. Uh -huh. and you want me to do it? No, no, I was just looking for something. Oh, I got, got I got all that fruit right away. I'll get it out. Oh, okay. Um, playing against the Dodgers, and Frank Howard was on the Dodger team, and the program you have to see it to believe it. It's like what two fifty down the line on the left hand. Two, yeah. No, two seventy nine left and two fifty seven and right. So, um, and Tracy, it was a football stadium that they converted to baseball. Yeah, actually, it was a, um, yeah, they played football there, but it initially was for the polo. Oh, I guess, I, yeah. yeah, they called it polo grounds. Anyway, so Tracy Salad happened to be pitcher. Um, I think it was Tracy Salad, I'm pretty sure, and uh, threw a fastball. Um, trying to get it pinned, Frank Howard. And Howard hit the ball so hard that it hit it. It, it was like a lower level in left field and then the upper level on top of that. And a big, like, facade or whatever. What would you call it? Facade? Yeah, like a, like a wall. Anyway, I don't know what to call that. Just, it was like. Was it like an overhang or was it? Yeah, it separated the top and the bottom. Hmm. And the ball hit the facade, I'll call the facade, and bounced back into the infield, and the shortstop picked it up. Hmm. But it was a home run. It was a home run, yeah. But, I mean, just something that impresses you. Mm -hmm. The crack of the bat, and all of a sudden, the shortstop picked it up the ball. Hmm. Hmm. I think the other thing that you guys have both mentioned at some point, and I love this this story is in that old st in Shea Stadium. I think it was, or no, Ebbets Field. There was the sign that said "Hit Sign Win Suit," and right. I thought that was as a kid. I remember you telling me about this. I thought it was amazing. Um, you can see that on, on that book I showed you. Abe Stark. Abe Stark. Mm -hmm. He's a borough president, but he his business was haberdasher. He, he had a that's called. You said haberdashery. Yeah. Hmm. Harry Truman was a haberdasher uh, hmm. before he became president. But it's basically a men's uh, clothing store. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know what's going the on. The thing that was great about that was, or what was safe about that, was that you had this right fielder who never let anything go by him. Mm -hmm. Carl Farrillo, he was a very good outfielder. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone ever won a suit. Do you know that anyone ever so. won a suit? I don't suit? think so. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so it was great publicity. I, I had seen him. I don't know if he was at the game, either on TV or at the game, where he, I had a uh, shot into right field, and Frillo picked up the ball and threw him out at first. Yeah, he was good at that. He was a he didn't run once. short right fielder. Right I mean, field. if you weren't fast. Mm -hmm. Also, sir, sir uh, I remember a um, catcher named Stan Lopata. I do. I saw him hit a ball over Mesa's head. Mm. And he wanted to put a triple. He may have been the only one in the, in baseball that would have made that into a triple. It would have been all. Because mm. the ball wound up hitting the fence. It was like 457 feet away in center field. Yes. About that. It was huge. Two guys hit home runs. I think two. Um, one was, I think, Adcock. He was a big, strong guy. So I remember being at your house um, for the 1954 World Series, which the Dodgers were not in, but it was the first game. And on your black and white TV, uh, in the first inning, I was rooting for Cleveland. I hated the Giants. The Giants were in it. And I like Cleveland, actually. And uh, Vic Wirtz hit a shot with bases loaded 
And this is the catch. The Many catch. days went back and back and back. Mm -hmm. I caught it over his shoulder, shoulder, turned around, threw it back into the infield. I think it was a double play. No, no. It wasn't a double no, play. No. Anyhow, it got out of the inning, and the Giants won the game and won the series in four after that. The Cleveland had won, I think, 111 games that year. Right. <laughs> and the Giants, sons of bitches. <laughs> they beat us. <laughs> we were always second to the Giants. Well, we were second that year to the Giants. I remember that team, too. Uh, but I remember watching that at your house, actually. Okay. <laughs> they didn't have, didn't have great teams. They had guys that, well, that's not a maze. Have a Muller? 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 Yeah. Don uh, the Mueller. slap hitter? Don Muller. Don Muller. I saw him step across the home plate and they tried to walk him and hit the ball and flip him into right field. Yeah, he was a hit for average. He didn't have power. But anyhow, you know, one thing I tell people <clears throat> is that from 1949 through 1956, which turns out to be a total of eight years, I think, 49, 50, and then six, no non-New York City team won a World Series game. I didn't for watch most that. of the years, it was the Dodgers, Yankees, or Giants, Yankees. Only two times it wasn't in 1950. The, the Dodgers, no, I'm sorry, the Yankees beat the Phillies four games to, to none, and in '54 the Giants beat Cleveland four games to none. So for a period of eight years, no non-New York City team won a World Series game. Mm. The Ralph rivalries are fantastic. Yeah, a lot of heads being thrown at and stuff like that. I, I have, I've got, I hated the Yankees a lot more than I did the Giants. Really, I hated the Giants. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> because they were we faced them the twenty-two rivals. times. <laughs> I, I, I know. Mm -hmm. I, it just like we kept on losing to, to uh, the World Series, the Yankees. Right. Well, I, during that year, that era. 50, uh, 49 to 56. The Yankees won six World Series, the Giants won, and the Dodgers won. Enough reason to hit the Yankees. Right. <laughs> I guess what's interesting, my other thought was, you know, in those eight years, you said no non New York City uh, or New York State, I guess. Well, City, 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 yeah. One. What's what I immediately think of is how many of those players are actually from New York City or state, probably next to none, right? Correct. Which yeah. is interesting, because I guess, you know, as a major city, one of the most major cities in yeah. the country, that, you know, you just, kind of like the, you know, the current day Yankees, and like, you know, like everybody. Yeah, but even today, uh, you know, most of the ball players come from either the South or from California. You know, the weather's better. You play more. They play year round. You know, that I guess that's something thing. I never thought of. Yeah, the weather. And we've got a lot of. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, a lot of universities, uh, big universities that have mm -hmm. baseball teams. Also, also a South American. Yeah, uh, now Central South, South American. American. Yeah, Central American. Yeah. But I guess also one thing that you guys probably experienced that mm, I don't remember at all, but. The, the reason the, the Dodgers Dodger got it. What's that? Nothing. Yeah. Why not? If you need it. But the Dodgers are called the Dodgers because they're the the trolley Dodgers, right? Right. right. And that's something that I, you know, like I have zero experience with because those haven't existed for yeah. a long time. But they did when you guys were around, and was it, you know, like, not I guess. that long. But it uh. must have also been like a, like, a considerable safety risk, right? I'm glad I took a picture before that. <laughs> Got it on camera, Dad. <laughs> First and only time. <laughs> but like things like that, you know, like we, you know, we take for granted. I don't know. I don't know if I take for granted, but it's just like 
there's no trolley, so I can't even imagine that type of system here. 16th Avenue, not far from where you are, had electric buses. Hmm. It's young. No, it's weird with it. Well, we still have trolleys in Boston, right? The T is basically a trolley. The, uh, right, it's, it's both above and below ground, and some of it's on street level. Right. Uh, I mean, the New York. Go. No. I have a problem, so. The New York City uh, subway system is. It's either below ground or above ground, but I don't think there's any time where it's street level. Mm -hmm. But I can picture it's just either going up above the streets or down below the streets. Would Judy Mason is? Hmm? Hmm. Would Judy Mason lives? Hmm. Uh, the wreck train run. Right now, it's all. You know. it's, it's almost on like a elevated it's um, it reminds me of like the Roman aqueducts you know like it's just it's, it's own thing that just is like right next to her it's like about, about maybe five or ten blocks until no, was it, so your uh, Dan had some questions yeah I forgot to mention this I guess the first one let's go with who was the best player you ever saw and I guess I have absolutely William Mays. Hmm. I, was, and, I, and I guess a. I guess why you know or how? Way. I just think he was the best player ever. Uh, smart, great arm, six hundred and sixty home runs, something like that. Um, played in a ballpark that was impossible to play in, which is the Polo Grounds, with all that depth in it, and uh, just. just just the, just the greatest football player I've ever seen. How about you, Al? Well, I have to agree, although when we were growing up, we Brooklyn fans felt that Duke Snyder was the best player. The best and Yankee fans so Yankee man. fans thought Mickey Mantle was the best player. And in fact, there's a whole song about this called Mickey, Willie, and the Duke. Hmm. Uh, but in retrospect, you know, looking back, I mean, they were all great players, but Mays, as Armin was saying, could do it all. He could hit for power, he hit for average, I think he's a lifetime 300, 301, something like that. He had a tremendous arm and he also stole bases. He was like a five or six tool player. He could do everything. Never, well. threw, never threw the wrong base. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I, I would agree. He's the best player I ever saw. Hmm. And the next question is just some of your memories of Ebbets Field. And I know we spoke a little bit about that, especially Armin. Just, just like it was a cathedral. It, you know, it just felt like you're going to a church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like a religious experience. Yeah, it really, it really was. I mean, it became that after a while. Yeah. And I guess, you know, now, you know, I'm not from New York City, but we have the skyscrapers and Manhattan and everything's huge and everything's massive and you just like, that's what it is. But maybe back in the day, things weren't so much, you know, you didn't, you know, it was... Yeah, God, they, they, uh, they sat 32,000 people. I mean, they used to fill up the stadium, but like, all these other ballparks now, 50,000, some of them even... Yeah, it was close to a hundred thousand. Considered to be a smaller, a smaller mm. ballpark. Mm. Like family, like family, similar. Right. You know, family. Put your hand. That era. Oh, yeah. It's just it's hard to hear. Yeah, um, it's uh, it was the same era as Fenway Park. I think it was built around nineteen ten. Fenway was nineteen twelve, something like that. Okay. And uh, they they weren't quite as big. Even uh, Wrigley Field, which is the only remaining park from that era, is also, I don't think it has 40,000 fans. Mm. But I mean, 40, it's still pretty big, but it's not like the stadiums that we have today. Right. The last question my friend Dan had was um, what was it like living in Brooklyn when they finally won the World Series in 1955? <laughs> Before. So I guess yeah, we could do a little bit of the before and be before. I mean, it's like like being 
being a New York Ranger fan, waiting 40 years for them to get up, mm -hmm. you know, before. But I guess, I mean, you guys lived it, like, walking down the street, like, you know, I, what was it like where people, like, even oh, it was okay if you lived in Brooklyn, it wouldn't have been so great if it was anywhere else, so. But I guess, yeah. yeah. Who's a bum? <laughs> it was Wait till uh, validation of our team. <laughs> Wait till next year. We came long. so close so many times. <laughs> and then two years later they were gone, which was very disappointing. We should talk about that. It was uh, very upsetting to us. Uh, you know, I was 13. 1959? 57. Seven. The last season was 57. And, and they uh, moved because, well, there's a lot of reasons, but was it Robert Moses that didn't want to build the stadium? Yeah, and O'Malley was greedy. Um, there's this wonderful little anecdote. Uh, three New York writers were having coffee together. I think one of them was Norman Mailer, Jimmy Breslin, and I can't think of who the third one was. Um, and they decided to play a parlor game to write down on a piece of paper the three most hated people in the history of the world. And when they turned them up, they all had the same three people, Hitler, Stalin, and Walter O'Malley. That's how we felt. He would have been uh, tarred and feathered if he came back to Brooklyn after that. Boy, he pissed up for a lot of people. Yeah. It's like, how many years later, they, uh, they bring the Mets back. That was 62, so it was five years later. Five years later. Mm -hmm. but and after that, what, the coil grounds went down about three years after that? You mean the shape when she went up? Yeah, that's right. The Mets played in the polo grounds for a few years. Mm -hmm. And then Brooklyn, the Ebbets Field is now Ebbets Field Apartments. Uh, right, right. And Flappish isn't what it was. Maybe yeah. changing. I wouldn't know, but it was you know it was like a it was like a uh, body blow to the city. I think it depressed Brooklyn mm -hmm. for a number of years. Do you mean like morale? Morale, or? everything. Yeah, and you know there was an economic loss as well. But it was uh, you know you had a major league baseball team and then you didn't. Mm -hmm. Two of them left, though. No, well, not so really. Polo Grounds was gone. That's so, right. At the same time, Giants moved out. Giants moved out. Mm -hmm. So, for me, I became an anti-Dodger fan. In fact, uh, throughout the remainder of the uh, 50s and the 60s, I rooted for the Giants, mm -hmm. my former enemies, because I felt that they had a right to move. They weren't drawing fans. They were. They had like 600,000 in the last couple of years. The Dodgers, even the last year, 1957, drew over a million, which was a lot at that time. Especially with that state, which is small. Yeah. So I felt that while the Giants, you know, I could understand why they moved, um, I didn't uh, forgive the Dodgers. <laughs> so I became a Giants fan. <laughs> What a 180. <laughs> it was a 180. Huh. But you know what? I, I remained a Dodger fan for a good right. for a couple of years. He and stayed a Dodger fan. It was so fan. hard to become a Dodger fan because everything, they, they, they were playing games at 11 o'clock at night. Right. Right, the time difference. So of 2 o'clock in the morning, you get a result. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's difficult. Yeah. I remember Kopech's perfect game. I think they, they used it like a Ticket tape kind of a thing, you know, like uh, you put on your little transistor radio and you hit tick tick tick, and then announce the game. Um, I may be wrong about that. <laughs> well, the other thing about the Dodgers is that they had wonderful announcers. They made the game. Two of them in particular, Red Barber. Uh, is one of the most highly respected sports announcers ever. He was with the Dodgers from sometime in the 40s to sometime in the 50s. And then his protege, Vince Scully, was from 1950 to last year, basically. Uh, 
uh, he was still going strong. He has this wonderful voice, and he's very literate, and he talks in complete sentences. Uh, some of his calls of games are in literature. They're, they're so beautifully spoken. But he's the one who uh, announced Kofak's uh, uh, perfect game. And that, that's a classic, just his call of that game. You know, the, the TV station, uh, at the baseball station, uh, they did a series on uh, announcers, yeah. mm -hmm. and nobody compared to Vince Cohen. He did, what, 60 years? Yeah, for the same team. Hmm. Can not figure out what? They had three announcers, because Connie Desmond was... Connie, Connie Desmond was also right. one. The Red Barber had his, yeah, he was good. He was colorful. He was a southern boy. Yeah, for sure. And I think he had a little bit of prejudice in him. Uh, yeah, he did. Uh, All right, Adam, I think we yeah, exhausted I think we're the good. subject for the moment, and then you can... Yeah. So let me get the fruit out. Yeah, <laughs> you can, yeah well, thank you. Right, you can do this your magic. This is going to be great. Yeah. I'll just